And now, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the Ray Shasho Show. Brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency. Each week, Ray spotlights in-depth interviews with legendary and up-and-coming authors and music artists. Ray also features the movers and the shakers of the music and publishing industries and suggests important methods for getting the most out of your public relations and marketing needs. Please welcome music journalist, author, and entrepreneur, Ray Shasho. And I'm Ray Shasho, broadcasting from BBS Radio, and welcome to the show where we spotlight legendary and up-and-coming music artists and authors, brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency. Call us today at 941-877-1552, or visit www.publicityworksagency.com. Remember, we shine only when we make you shine. Loggins and Messina, Poco, Buffalo Springsfield, uh, these are just a few of the mo- monumental musical groups that singer, songwriter, guitarist, Jim Messina has been involved with. As an artist, his resume speaks for itself with a string of hits, including Your Mama Don't Dance, Angry Eyes, Peace of Mind, among others. As a producer and engineer, he's done sessions with some of the greatest in rock and pop, such as Kenny Loggins, The Doors, uh, Lee Michaels, Herb Alpert, and the Tijuana Brass, and the aforementioned Buffalo Springfield, where he also replaced bassist Bruce Palmer for the band's final album. 2016 found Messina active and creative as ever with a new live album entitled In the Groove. The album was made in anticipation of the fact that I changed booking agents to the Roots Agency, says Messina. They did a tremendous amount of research and found that there are a lot of areas I had not been to and where people would like to see me. They wanted to book me in those places. Messina knew that a key component to the tour would be a new album. But an album of new material at that point in time would be difficult, he says, when in fact most people want to see me for who I am in terms of what I've done over the years and all the bands I've been in. So in September of 2015, he took his band into the Clark Center for the Performing Arts in Arroyo Grande, California, at the Lobero Theater in Saint Barbara, uh, Santa Barbara, California, for two nights of the singer-songwriter's retrospective catalog. As a special guest for the evening, Messina invited longtime collaborator and former Poco Steel guitarist Rusty Young to join in on those songs that they made musical history with together. The icing on the cake for Messina was to invite respected audio expert Paul Wolf of Paul Wolf Designs to record the shows. Wolf relates, I steamed it live with HD video while mixing front of house while mixing front row seats while mixing mono mix for the monitor guy while mixing side fills while tracking we took two nights and mixed for three months and released the usb and vinyl double chris marov welcome to 1979 made the vinyl lacquers and the mother's mother stampers without any record companies itunes or cd baby we used indiegogo and are about to do another with Pledge Music, as we have a friend that runs it. As Wolf stated, the album is available in USB format because the inventive and far-thinking Messino wanted to take things a step further. I believe we're moving into times now where the CD is basically gone, says Messina. There will always be people with CD players, but moving forward, I did some research. My wife actually told me about this. She handed me this little flashcard at a convention, we were at. She said it was a hard drive. So I started to play around with it, put some MP3s on it, and put it on my computer. I played it in my truck. I thought this might be the thing that we as industry and industry might need to focus on. To purchase Jim Messina's In the Groove with special guest Rusty Young and Jim Messina uh, live uh, at the Clark Center for Performing Arts, visit www. JimMessina.BandCampCamp.com. So that's in the groove with special guest Rusty Young and Jim Messina live at the Clark Center for Performing Arts. www.JimMessina.BandCamp.com. It is my great pleasure to welcome singer, songwriter, multi instrumentalist, and producer Jim Messina to the Ray Shasho Show. Welcome, Jim. Thank you very much. Wow, you did your research. 
<laughs> you, you, you have to these days. <laughs> That's right. You know, you can't just and tweet. You can't just tweet it. <laughs> you can't. Not not, not anymore. <laughs> it, it's amazing, though. Some some guys are easy. They've been in one band, but when when you have a guy that's been in three legendary groups, you know, it it, it does get pretty uh, <laughs> intense as far as uh, doing the research. You know, it, t- it takes takes time. <laughs> Well, it's interesting. It's just as an artist, you know, listening to the, uh, listening to you speak and <clears throat> about all these things. I just it, it's it happens very quick in terms of words, but boy, behind all of that is a tremendous amount of energy and effort and t- and teamwork that, that makes all that happen. Yeah, you sound so laid back after all the things you've done too. It's it's amazing. Well, I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> First, first of all, I want to talk about your tour dates. Um, okay. Now, let's see, February 10th, which is coming up soon, you're going to be in Fort, Peace, uh, Fort, yeah, Fort Pierce, Florida, at the Summer Crush of Vineyard. In no, the, actually, uh, that's Vineyard. not true. The, uh, a it's couple not. of those dates were changed, and uh, okay. the places that we're going to be at now would be on the 11th. We're going to be uh, in uh, Fort Lauderdale, uh, Fort Lauderdale, I believe. Right. And then on the 12th, we'll be in Clearwater, um, at the Amatoro Theater, so it's just two dates in, in uh, February. You'll be at the Capitol Theater, which you know I cover those uh, areas, Capitol and and also uh, Ruth Eckert Hall. And you'll be with uh, Pure Prairie League, another one of my favorite bands. Yeah, yeah, we're looking forward to that. Now, what what are the theaters? Just so we all get it clear. On the eleventh, what is what is the theater and the city that we're going to be in again? Uh, the eleventh, you've got the uh, in Fort Lauderdale, uh, the Broward Center. Is it Amaturo Theater? That yes, that's that's correct. Yes. Okay, and what and happened then, to the Fort Pierce State? Is that not happening? I don't I don't know that it ever. Uh, I think what they did is they started uh, publishing before they actually had booked all the dates and it. I got and you. Then, and so the the two that actually finally got booked were those two that I just mentioned to you. I, I've got other dates. You got uh, Connecticut. Um, uh, you'll be in Shirley. Uh, in yes. Shirley, Maine. Um, yes. Wayne, New Jersey. You'll be in Pennsylvania, yep. back in Santa, Santa Barbara, uh, Gr- Green Lake, Wisconsin, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, Illinois, and, and, and Chicago at the City Winery. That'll yes. be on March March 26. Mm-hmm. And That's everyone can go to your website um, to check out further dates as they come along as well. Absolutely. We're just now uh, booked through March, and uh, they're starting to. Uh, I'm going to take April off and just take a break, and then we'll start up again in uh, May, June, and July, and I think they're booking all the way into 18 at this point. I got you. Let, let's talk about your uh, live album. This is the second live album in the, since 2012, right? The, the, uh, yes, yes, yeah. and, 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 and I think your, your, your story about, um, you know, uh, beginning with the Roots Agency was, was uh, pretty clear, and I'll, I can redefine that a little bit. Um, when when I signed with them, we talked about the fact that I had not been on the East Coast, Florida, and those areas in, in quite a while, mainly playing out on the West Coast. And and, uh, and Tim Drake, who who is my agent now, said, you know, we really need to reunite your audiences with who you are. I mean, there's a lot of people who want to see you, and you've got a lot of music even past all of this. He said, but I think it's I think it's best you consider reintroducing them to what you've done, where you've been, and where you're going. So. The second live album that I did, uh, I was fortunate enough to um, uh, to have Rusty uh, want to sit in with me, and I thought, you know, the best way to give credibility to to all of the works, it's it's always nice when we can work with you know pals that we've worked in the past. So what I did is I put together on on this new album in the groove the songs that uh, that I favored the most or enjoyed the most, either as a producer. Or, uh, or as a writer, or you know, a performing artist, uh, and I wanted to pay tribute to my past uh, pals like uh, like Richie Fiore. So, um, in Springfield, you know, he had uh, written a song called "Kind Woman," which Steve Stills had had tapped me on the shoulder and said, "Please don't forget that for Richie." And so, when we when we went in to record it, uh, we were in New York. Uh, the band, the Buffalo Springfield, really wasn't there at that time. They were supposed to show up, so. Uh, Arif Mardin, who at that time worked with Ahmed Erdogan at Atlantic, had put together a small group for me. We recorded the basic tracks, and when we got back to uh, L.A., uh, we were in the process of finishing it when when I wanted to put a steel guitar player on it. And our um, 
our roadie, who uh, Miles Thomas at the time had, had was from Colorado, and he said, "Boy, you know, I know somebody who I think might be a good choice." And so, rather than getting the Buddy Emmons of the day or the Sneaky Pete's and those people, he, we decided to give it a shot, and we brought Rusty out from from Denver, and we were so impressed with his talent and the overdub on that original um, uh, recording that that pretty much is what started really uh, Poco, uh, uh, you know, a year or so earlier. And so uh, my relationship with Rusty has always been much, one of which that I've really enjoyed our musical uh, abilities and when we do play together. So I invited him to come out and sit in with me so we could do Kind Woman, we could do Child's Claim to Fame from the Springfield, and then, of course, uh, You Better Think Twice, which was, a, was Poco's first hit, uh, which had Rusty again on it. And then I wanted him to um, sit in on a couple of songs that I had done in Loggins and Messina, which was uh, listen to a country song in the Holiday Hotel, mainly because those songs were, were pretty much in my mind and in the process of being written as I left the band. And when I started working with Kenny, uh, he was at a point where he was pretty much just writing folk songs. You know, he was a uh, singer-songwriter working for ABC Dunhill, and and he was able to. Uh, he's such a you know phenomenal vocalist that he. They'd say, "Hey, write a, write an Elton John song, okay?" And he'd he'd write it <laughs> and sound and sound like Elton John. Hey, how about a Leon Russell? Okay, I can do that too. And so I mean, he was such a gifted guy, and uh, we needed to get material for him. So um, I chose to bring those songs into that early sitting in album for Kenny, and I did do together. And um, but I always always felt they were kind of poco stuff that i was bringing forward so having rusty sit in on that uh at the performing arts center i could say well you know if i'd stayed with poco these songs would have probably been released on poco so to give you a sense of what it might have sounded like we have rusty performing on them and he does such a fantastic job on those on those two recordings especially so the album to be able to come forward now uh, they, I, I wanted to put some of the older tunes on there, which is an introduction from Springfield and Poco, mm-hmm. and also in Loggins and Messina. But it also has some of my, um, there's an album I have out called Under a Mojito Moon, and I've got a song called Mojito Moon on that that's recorded you know, acoustically. And then I re-recorded a song called um, Keep Me In Mind, that's what it was. And mm-hmm. Keep Me In Mind originally was on the Logs and Messina album, and Larry Sims, who was our bass player in those days, was a phenomenal singer. And for some reason, I don't know if it was because Kenny and I were selfish or just complacent or overlooked the fact that the guy was really great. So I wrote a tune that I was going to do myself. Instead, I gave it to, to Larry to sing, and he sang it on our... Um, I can't remember exactly what album that was, but I want to say it was maybe Mother Load or... Mm-hmm. or during that period of time. And, and subsequent, subsequent which we, we, we've lost Larry. And so as a tribute to Larry and his gift uh, to me uh, as, as a songwriter, I've been performing that song. Uh, so there's, there's, there's a combination of some of the Springfield stuff that I produced, um, some of the Poco stuff that I wrote. Uh, we used to do, on the earlier album, I did uh, a re rearrangement of Carefree Country Day, which was on the Buffalo Springfield album. But I, since that was recorded already, I figured, you know, let's move forward. But the album will consist a lot of of uh, what I've done uh, in the past, where I am now. So it gives the audiences that are coming a, a good, full retrospective, but also the guys that I have playing with me are... Are, are eloquent in the sense that they can easily do folk music, mm-hmm. easily do country music, but we end our, our set really with with more of a upbeat Latin jazz, uh, rock and roll, that your mama don't dance. Uh, they're just superior musicians. I have a, a violinist, guitarist, um, Gary Oliar, <clears throat> who's also a singer, who's one of the musicians, and uh, George Hawkins, was with me way way back in Longus Messina in 1976. Right. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh, so he, he's very familiar with all the music that we we started with from that time. I've got Dave Byer on drums, 
who recorded uh, on this in the Groove album. In fact, all the musicians that will be in Florida are the actual musicians that recorded oh, awesome. the, the album. Great. So I, I'm trying to bring the credibility uh, of the recordings into the concert performances, which I think is really important. And as I move on in my life, I realize that in this day and age, the digital age, the only thing that really remains analog, both audio and visual, is a live performance. <laughs> so, yeah, you true. know, it's nice when, when, when I can bring everybody that we've worked together to create this music together on stage for the audience to appreciate. Thank you.
with this album is the the access all card correct mm -hmm. what, what is that all about <clears throat> well access all card is sort of a when it came time for me to make uh, this album as a CD mm -hmm. I, I just kept realizing my wife bought a computer that doesn't have uh, a CD on it uh, the iPads you know certainly don't have a CD player on it and I just started realizing that we're, we're moving into a place where it, it's going to go away Right, and in anticipation of that happening, as you pointed out, I she had found a, a little hard drive flash card that somebody had given us as a promotion, and I looked at it and initially I thought this is fine and threw it on the desk and that was it. And then I started thinking about it and experimenting with whether or not this could actually, you know, maybe even substitute for CDs, mm -hmm. because in the past, you know, we've tried. DVDs that have added value in terms of videos or data on them, but they never really went went over that well. And I think that's just because not everybody at that point in time had the access or even the knowledge inside of a computer that they do have right. now. Right. You know, a, a four-year-old can take an iPad and get around <laughs> on it a lot quicker than most adults. So yeah. the, the 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 mentality of there of what it is and and how to use it is there. So. Going into that card, I realized, you know, I could not only do my album as an MP3, but people who do want CDs, I have a folder on there that has a 2448-bit audio files of all of, mm -hmm. the, all of the masters. So, in essence, if you really would like to have a CD and a high-quality CD, I'm allowing you to be able to go in there and burn your own. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and, and uh, then you can play it at home or in the car. But I've also, we, 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 we streamed that particular concert live. And while DVDs really don't sell that well, I mean, I don't know if an artist that's really sold a lot of those, mainly more CDs, but it is nice having a, a picture, be able to go there and do that. So the In the Groove album, which we released initially as a vinyl, um, even though it is a double album, it only will hold a certain amount of time because you're limited by by space right. so we couldn't we couldn't really get the encore on there so yeah. i figured well we'll 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 give the album an opportunity to have the encore on the access all card but as an added value the encore is also on there as a video dvd so i have another folder that has a video in it so you can see the whole 27 minute encore in addition as and i'm experimenting with this you know to give it some real value, some added value, I also added all of the song lyrics to all of the song in PDF format so a person could print it out and sing along with it or if they're doing the you know, home karaoke, they can do that. Uh, if they want to have a better picture of what it is that I'm saying, they can do that. Mm -hmm. I've also included all of the artwork for the album cover, oh, inside, front, and back, yep. so a person can print it out and look at it as they're listening to the music if they want, or frame it or create their own picture, full, uh, poster. In addition to that are all of the set lists that was original set list, hmm. what I edited it down to. For those you know, guitar techies who want to know what my tunings were right. yep. and all that stuff, it's all there, and as well as photographs. So there's a lot of added value to what a person can get 
But the thing that I liked about it most is I made it so that it was the size, the identical size of a of a, an American Express card uh, with a laminate on it. Uh, yeah, I saw a to, picture of it. It's yeah, really to put cool. a lanyard on it. Yeah. So when you're done with it, after you have finished, gotten everything you need, erase it and put it in your wallet next to your credit card. And if you're out and about and you need to download something, you've got an instant hard drive of 8 gigs right there to download it to. And then as we start to move forward, there's serial numbers on those cards, you know, like there is on a, on a regular credit card. And when a person buys it, we know who bought it. And if they show up later at a gig uh, someplace, wherever we are, uh, that gets them into the meet and greets right up front. And if we're doing digital downloads, they'll be able to get a discount off of anything they buy. So that little perspective of, of how I'm using it, I thought might be a, a inspiration for other artists to, to use the same type of format. Now, you don't need to buy an 8-gig drive. You know, those things are about, I think, just to buy them to manufacture them wholesale are about 3 bucks, mm-hmm. so they're not cheap. Yeah. But... You can buy one that's a lot less, that's closer probably to the cost to manufacture what a CD is today, and still have enough room on there to put some photos, pictures and things like that, or artwork, uh, and, and have a great deal of value to your uh, to the person who's purchasing the, the card. And again, um, I don't know where the industry is going. I don't know what the next format's going to be, but they're leaving us high and dry yeah. when they stop putting CDs on mm-hmm. computers. Um, so we, as, as an industry, as, as the performing artists, need to have something to sell at a gig so that people can walk away with, with, with something that they enjoyed from that show. Because most of the sales uh, really happen um, right there at the gig. Mm-hmm. That's true. Yeah, I, I, I covered uh, John Mayall. He was here in Sarasota for his 80th birthday. And he was out there selling CDs, you know. Mm-hmm. Right before the show and right after the show, mm-hmm. and I, yeah, I think you're right. Most of the artists do sell mo- a lot of their uh, material just you know during or after the show. Mm-hmm. I think you might so, have revolutionized the uh, the next step for the you know. Well, I, I, I hope so uh, j- for the sake of the artists because mm-hmm. um, I'm starting to I'm starting to see the frustration of uh, of what's happening. In addition, you know. Um, Look, a lot of stuff is being streamed nowadays, whether it's Pandora yeah. or any other mode, and, and that's here uh, to stay. Mm-hmm. iTunes is here to stay. In some, so our value is really in our digital uh, intellectual piece of property, and it, more than likely uh, you're going to... I know my royalties uh, have shifted from, from um, tapes and vinyls to CDs, and now mm-hmm. CDs are starting to fall off the royalties, and I'm starting to see the downloads start to show up. So it's only it's only a matter of time before we move into a direction where the physical aspect of all of this is probably not going to play a very important part, unless unless you can give somebody added value. And that was the whole purpose in this experiment was, at the very least, give them something they can plug in their car and their USB and play it, give them something they can download at home, that they can utilize and enjoy, and then instead of having something you throw in the trash, you erase it, put it in your wallet, and you still have value there. Right. You know, I think the uh, the music of fishing at Unato really misses, you know, a good good artwork from the album and also liner notes, and, you know, all that is missing. And mm-hmm. now you've got it all, which mm-hmm. is great. Yeah, and you can print it in any format you want. If you yeah. if you just have a you know an 8.5 by 11 printer, Yep. And even some, uh, you know, some photograph paper, you could print something out that's pretty nice. Uh, but if you have a large format printer, you could print out something, you know, 36 inches by whatever you want. <laughs> yeah, it's tremendous. And they can all get this at the uh, jimmessina.bandcamp.com, right? That's correct. Right now, that's how we have right. it. We have it out there, and uh, it seems to be working uh, pretty nicely. Um, uh, and a nice thing about Bandcamp for any artist at this point mm-hmm. is that if you have T-shirts or if you have posters and other things or even other product CDs or whatever, um, they're there to s- help service you. Uh, CD Baby has been one of mine for quite a while, uh, mm-hmm. and they've done a, a tremendous job 
but you send everything to them, and of course they mail it out, which is a great luxury. Right. But you're going to be spending four dollars a CD for every one of those that you send out. So if your CD is only selling for, you know, ten or twelve bucks, you're you're thirty three percent of your mm-hmm. your profit is going away right there. So Bandcamp takes about ten, but you have to do some extra work. And uh, right. I, I I don't think you know making a a trip to the post office once a week is that big a deal. Yeah, I, I agree. Just do it on the way to the market, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> You know, I called I called Loggins and Messina America's band. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, I mean, there was and there was nothing better than watching you guys in 1973 on the Midnight Special. Uh, but by the way, you look a, a lot like uh, uh, Keanu Reeves on stage that night. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. You, you had his look. If you go back on YouTube and look at your uh, 73 Midnight Special. Oh, I'll have to check that yeah. out. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Now I look more like the dude, uh, Jeff Bridges. <laughs> <laughs> I have to tell somebody, I'm not the dude, but I do <laughs> dig the eagle. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> I, I saw you guys perform at the uh, at the Cap Center in Maryland because I'm originally from the D.C. area, so I was lucky enough to have the cellar door and and all that in my backyard. Mm-hmm. And I remember Tom, Tom Rush uh, opened for you guys, and I've interviewed Tom. He's a great guy. Um, and you had a sellout of 19,000 people, I remember that night. Oh, my God. And, uh, I mean, the 70s, I, you know, you remember, I, what always sticks in my mind is Loggins and Messina and Seals and Crofts. I mean, you guys were kind of like the the it duos. I know Hall & was there, too, but I always think of uh, you guys and Seals and Crofts at that time. Yeah, that was pretty much, that was the, the uh, what was popular. And, you know, and what's really interesting about Seals and Crofts is that, um, I used to go watch them at the Troubadour when they first started, mm-hmm. and I was just so impressed the fact that the two of them could sit up there and make so much music. Their first album, the blend, the the, mm-hmm. the, the songs, everything was just super. And then later I find out <laughs> that um, Jim Seals, and maybe even Dash, I can't remember, and Glenn Campbell, they were on one of my favorite records as a kid, which was uh, the Champs, which Tequila, remember? Do da do 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 do. Yeah, yeah, they That's were they were the, on that album, huh? Yeah, that, those, uh, those guys were huh. the Champs, <laughs> and kidding, I think right? that, and I think that's Jimmy Seals playing the saxophone. <laughs> I didn't know that. Is that wild? And I think I Glenn Campbell know. was in that that group too. But you, you'll have to check yeah. it out. Get, maybe get a hold of them. But uh, yeah, I was. Huh. That's one of my favorite all time songs. You're, you're, it's funny because you know when you uh, you and Kenny worked together, I, I think you you weren't planning on touring, right? With with, with uh, in a van, you were just wanting to produce and be an engineer. Well, uh, that was the, that was the deal. I I had signed yeah. a contract right after Poco with uh, with uh, Columbia Records as an right. independent producer, and uh, they had given me Andy Williams as an opportunity. And while I think Andy Williams is one of the greatest singers of all time, there was mm-hmm. such an age difference in us that. Right. Uh, and I was not really uh, ready to start working with orchestras. Um, I was still in a different part of my musical interests, and so I, you know, I gracefully declined that. Uh, they had given me some other artists, which was not a good fit. And finally, I was thinking, boy, you know, here I <laughs> signed six album deal a year, and I'm <laughs> I'm already six months into it. I haven't even <laughs> done anything. So that's when I thought, well. You know, I, I think Kenny Loggins would be the best choice. But even then, I, I chose somebody who had never really, you know, recorded an album before, never been a performing artist, no, no lawyer, you know, no business manager, no, mm-hmm. no managers, agents. And I, while I, while I had a lot of faith in him, I realized that if he did not have the kind of help that you need when you're at that level, there's right. a good chance that. Not only will he not make it, but not only will my album not sell that I'm producing. So, I decided to um, to offer my my services not only as a producer, but in some cases it's almost it's almost in the management area where you where you need to find yeah. certain people for them. And, and right. being his producer, he needed to find his own attorney because I didn't want to have a conflict of interest there. So. He, he found an attorney that could represent him, and uh, if 
finally negotiate a deal, and then I helped him to pull this band together. I, I pulled musicians together that I had worked with, like uh, uh, well, Merle Bergani and Larry Sims were from the Sunshine Company, and they'd opened up for Poco. That's where I met them. Al Garth lived below me in a place on Vista Del Mar, below my wife and I, and I used to hear him diddle around on the fiddle and the sax, and I thought, you know, he's pretty good. Mm-hmm. And then eventually we uh, auditioned um, we auditioned John Clark, who uh, became the second horn player. Um, and um, between myself and uh, Michael Amartian, who's a keyboard player, we managed to uh, to get Kenny's album arranged uh, in a manner that could be recorded. We lost Michael; he did not want to did not want to tour. Uh, so that left Kenny, a bass player, a drummer, and two horn players, and it didn't quite seem to have what it really needed. So I continued to work and rehearse with Kenny. And eventually I went to, to Clive Davis and asked permission to to actually record on this album uh, with the idea in mind that I would sit in for the first tour, get him started helping with agents and managers and get all that stuff in place and give him a, at least a good shot at having an opportunity to to come out of the gate with some interest. And um, mm-hmm. Kate, Clive kind of he didn't like the idea at first, and and for good reasons. You know, the guy's the guy's a, a brilliant man, and he felt that he didn't want to release an album with a band that was going to break up after the first album. He'd had enough of that crap. <laughs> and uh, so I, you know, it took me a while to convince him that this was not going to break up after the first and that right. there have been a number of albums that have been released throughout the years you know Stan Getz Charlie Bird a lot of the jazz people always had people sitting in with them you had Leon Russell with with Joe Cocker you know you had him uh, there was just so many examples of how things could work and I think uh, Clive had, had known me from well he knew me from Poco and he knew that when I said I would do something I would mm-hmm. I delivered that album, uh, as I promised with the Poco Deliver an album, and got everybody out, got myself replaced, and got this album recorded. So he gave me some rope uh, that I could either hang myself with or or climb climb on board. And uh, fortunately, the the it worked. That first sitting in tour worked. We sold about 150,000 albums in that period of time, which was. Um, they were very, very excited about, and that's when they asked me if I would consider staying with Kenny. And I said, "Well, you know, you need to talk to Kenny about that because this is mm-hmm. his, his solo record." And Kenny said, "No, I, I, things are working great, and let's let's keep it moving." So that's kind of how Lagos of Messina was born. And uh, I was, it was, I was totally not really wanting to go back out on the road. I was tired of right. that. Yeah. But, uh, it all worked out for everybody, I think, the best. Just a great band. <clears throat> I think you guys sold close to, you know, over 20 million albums at Lagos and Messina. And you, and you had um, so many albums that, you know, you released. You had uh, Sitting In, um, of course, you had the, the Lagos and Messina in 72, Full Sail, On Stage, Mother Load, So Fine, Native Sons, and Finale, right, in 1977, right. I believe. Yeah. And then they released a, a Best Of after that, which was kind of a combination of all of those. Kind of like I'm doing right now in the groove is my Best Of. Right. <laughs> and the songs, man. I mean, you know, Your Mama Don't Dance is, is a, a staple in Top 40 history. Danny Song, of course, House at Pooh Corner. But uh, my favorite of all times, uh, one of my top ten songs of all time is definitely Angry Eyes. Oh, my God, what a song. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and we, I still do it. I'll be doing that when I'm in Florida. Another mm-hmm. tune that has has arisen that I, I do, and it's a very difficult arrangement for most people to do because of mm-hmm. the instrumentation, but I'm doing Be Free um, with the mandolin, and, and uh, John Clark was a double reed player, so he had an oboe on that. And um, the guy who's with me on horn on woodwinds right now uh, Craig Thomas was actually with me back in 1979 when I did the Oasis album, my solo album. So I've got him out, and while he doesn't play double reed, we've managed to find a, it's a small, it's, I don't know if it's called a sapronino, but it's a, it's a uh, 
soprano saxophone, smaller, mm-hmm. and we can bite down on the on the the reed enough to where you get a smaller oboe kind of sound. Um, it's not quite as mellow as an oboe, but the the timbre is pretty close. So, in between that and the violin playing the uh, the parts, it just really they do a fantastic job. When I send you the uh, when I send you the upload for the new music mm-hmm. for you to use, you'll you'll have a chance to hear it. But be free, just get standing ovation every night. So, okay, that and, and Angry Eyes, like you say, are are two of the songs that people really really love. And then what's really kind of come into its own is uh, You Need a Man. I I actually give that uh, arrangement an opportunity for all the mission, musicians to stretch out on. So when you get a chance to hear You Need a Man, it's pretty funky and kind of. R and B, and then moves into really more of a Latin jazz on the mm-hmm. ending. So the musicianship on there, the fellows do such a great job. I'm 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 I'm, I'm very honored to have the opportunity to be working with them. Yeah, they, you know, you cannot associate you just as a folk country singer. You're, you're very eclectic in your music, right? You know, and Angry Eyes proves that. I mean, yeah. what you know, it's 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 got so much you know jazz influence in that song. It's, it's well, if you ever want to have a, a little bit of fun, mm-hmm. there's a there was a movie I score I worked on many many years ago in the '60s, right? Called Evil Roy Slade. It was sort of like a a Mel Brooks type production, you know, that huh. kind of humor, Blazing Saddles kind of where it was going. It's yeah. called Evil Roy Slade, and um, it stars Mickey Rooney, and I can't remember the lead actor. <laughs> he was a comedian. Uh, Mickey Rooney plays the part of a of a telegraph entrepreneur who wore his index finger out, tapping those messages out. <laughs> but but uh, you'll notice that in, when the bad guys come into town, you'll hear a a rendition of where Angry Eyes came from. Really? It's got, it's got that boom, dam, 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 dam. It's, it's, it's really, when I hear it, now I go, wow. It's, it's interesting that I had had that vision way back when and then it mm-hmm. evolved to something else but it's kind of a, a, a fun piece of musical history for you to play with if you ever want to dig it out I'm going to have to check that out you also have a little bit of uh, like a, a Latin uh, you know influence as well on a lot of your which I love because you know my mom was Cuban uh-huh. <laughs> so I got it in the blood <laughs> you bet Cuban music yeah. is some of the most sophisticated um, Latin jazz there is I love Cuban music. I love the uh, Buena Vista Social Club yep. when that came out, and I and I just the keyboard player on there, but just I oh. great he musicians. Could, yeah, he could stretch from one measure over into the other, mm-hmm. and you never knew where it was supposed to have been or where it's going. But whatever whatever it is, it's great. <laughs> yeah. You know, I miss I miss that on mainstream uh, today. In the mainstream, is is great musicians, and you know, you mentioned how hard it is to reproduce, you know, an album that you've done and recorded and reproduce that in the live show. And I've I've seen a lot of great bands just kind of fail fail at that. Mm-hmm. I mean, I, yeah. I saw the Stones, which were horrible, on one of their tours. Um, you know, you know I, I love Led Zeppelin. I've seen them several times, but sometimes, you know, Jimmy Page, that, that guitar does not sound the same like it did on the album, you know? So uh, well, and I and I and I think uh, I think I learned my lesson about that when I started making just studio albums. Uh, you know, my album what was it called? Um, the one, Oasis was actually uh, we could reproduce that. I had every mm-hmm. player on that album when we went out and performed, so we could always reproduce it. But when I started to do Messina and One More Mile um, and working with studio players. You have some of the best players in the world to be able yeah. to refer to. The problem is exactly as you said. How do I get that back out on the stage? And uh, that that is very very difficult. And I think it's okay if you're not a performing artist. You know, if you're not going to go out and perform, um, then that's fine. Or if you are a performing artist and you're getting a lot of money per date to be able to afford to bring the A players in, um, then, then that's okay, too. Uh, I don't know too many, too many performing artists that are 
capable of doing that unless they're they're generating high income through sales. I mean, through their ticket sales. Mm-hmm. Um, and like you pointed out, the Rolling Stones should be able to do that. Um, but somewhere along the line, it, your show that you saw, they, they, they apparently missed the boat on that one. They but, missed the um, boat. Yeah. It, it's just hard. You know, it's very hard if you're using A players. Um, most of those people don't tour. They're doing three or four sessions a day. Um, yeah. They can't afford to go into town. But, uh, yes, when, I, when I'm able to get my guys and we're able to go out and perform and, and reproduce this, um, which for me is extremely important because that's, that's what I am. I'm a performing mm-hmm. artist, and it just so happens that I write and produce and publish my own works and, and record. I'm also an engineer, so I, you know, I, I do the mixing and recording on that. Um, and, and thank God I have people like Paul Wolf mm-hmm. who can you know, do the tracking and be up front when I need them, and then we can come back and, and sit down and, and do that. By the way, you mentioned with 30 days uh, a month to mix it. It really w- would have taken a lot less time for us to do that, but we were just you know doing it a few hours a day. Um, we hadn't really planned on on really releasing that thing too quickly, uh, but by the time we got it done, we went, oh my God, we <laughs> we got to get this thing out. We've been yeah. horsing around through Christmas, you know, and <laughs> Thanksgiving and all that stuff, and um, the time passed before we knew it. Uh, we'd been having too much fun. The other the other thing <clears throat> about performing live, uh, and even in the studio, is you got to find your, the right equipment, right? The the right microphones. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you know the right amps, the right you know everything's got to be just just right. I, I was re- I was watching something on the other day on television about the technology, at, you know, with music, and they were talking about the you know just getting the right microphone for the vocalist is so important. You know, and I never realized that. You know how well you know, it, it 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 is because each vocalist has a different sounds you know they right. have a different resonating factor with their voices and and microphones each and everyone has their own characteristic um the more expensive ones you know the telefunkens and the neumanns made in the mm-hmm. 40s and 50s um they were they were pretty special because they they were they were tubed they were really flat and they were very sensitive right and they could produce just reproduce just about anything uh, but I, I having done this all my life is that uh, yes i think the vocal mic probably is 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 the one of the most important the problem with live though because of the amount of sound reinforcement there is you have to pick a microphone that's going to reject uh, you know outside ambient noise so that it's, it's it doesn't mask the, the vocalist and and so you don't you have limited choices there um, but when it comes to the other thing, you know, the, the, the key is, and most musicians don't learn this till later in life, is that you can't just turn it up to 11 and play. Yeah, exactly. Uh, while, while that feels good, it, it, yeah. it, it just, it's, it's a killer for a microphone, right. and it's a killer for somebody trying to capture it. But once, once people have an amp that they really like the sound of, they can keep the volume down. There's a lot of choices you can do with microphones. Some people mm-hmm. like to use a, a ribbon because it doesn't quite have the high end and it's a warmer bottom end, you know. Some people like to use a lot of different things. What we did with this album, because we wanted to have some fun and, and also support some of our friends, is we had uh, Sennheiser, a friend of mine who I used to actually work with and perform with and on, at times on stage, um, he donated uh, all the mics for the drums and for the guitars, for my guitars anyway. Really? Huh. So we used we used the Sennheiser microphone, something that anyone can buy at Sweetwater. Right. Uh, and we mic'd everything in that way and the guitars in that way. And then uh, we, we actually used a Personas recording console. I mean, Digit Design is one of my favorite uh, consoles that they make out there. But for most artists, they can't afford that. Mm-hmm. And... Um, and I wanted, again, to play around, since I was playing around with the extra all card and experimenting here, I wanted to experiment with some other options that people can do that they, right. they can't afford. So we used the uh, Personas 32 AI console, and mm-hmm. uh, they have their own uh, recording application called Capture. Uh, okay. While I prefer, prefer Pro Tools because of all of the 
right. different uh, aspects that, that I can do in the studio. There's no reason not to use the capture program, which is very easy. So we captured both evenings with that particular application, Capture by uh, Persona. And then I brought them into Pro Tools, and I actually brought the console into the studio and uh, put it in the, the recording room and hooked my guitars up just exactly the way they were on stage, same mics and all that stuff. And I listened, you know, to the recordings. And if anything had gotten, uh, you know, chord had come out or I played a bad note that just was unacceptable, all I had to do is just take that one note, go back in the studio, because I was on a transmitter, press record and pick up the, the E instead of the E flat, punch it in, punch it out and <laughs> no one no, there, I mean I would have done that you know in an analog session right right so right. that fixed it because all the mics were consistent the amps were consistent I could fix that one little note I did on the, I think it was on changes I had hit a wrong note or same old wine I can't remember fixed mm-hmm. it and it's a done deal and had I had any problems with the horns or anything like that, I could have brought them in using the same mic, picked up a note here and there, and we would, we would have had no problem. So, you know, as long as your levels are right, you're recording at a, at a good volume on stage, and you have decent equipment, that sort of demystifies the whole process. It, it's mm-hmm. about the band. It's about the music. It is, it's it about is, the song. It's about yeah. the feel. Right. And um, if you capture that... Without distorting everything. Yeah. You know, you're in pretty good shape. Sit and stare into the fire Slowly burning The morning light is near The starry night is clearly shining Firelight's dancing on your head as you lay sleeping How are you dreaming? Your smiling eyes reveal Exactly how I feel concerning I love the music that we make And the time we take To get to where we're going May this melody I bring Inspire you to sing A song to keep us growing There is a warm and gentle breeze Softly blowing The scent of pine is sweet Moonlight on the leaves are glowing I turn to you as you away The night has fallen And daylight's calling Your open arms reveal Exactly how I feel concerning the music that we make And the time we take To get to where we're going And may this melody I bring Inspire you to sing A song to keep us going I love 
the music that we make And the time we take To get to where we're going May this melody I bring It's one of those songs that I, uh, I wrote for my wife, and uh, I figured, you know, I better start performing it or I'm going to get in trouble. <laughs> uh, this is also on that album called Under a Mojito Moon, and uh, it's one of my older tunes that I, I, I wrote many, many years ago, and I, I wanted to bring some life back to it, so we're going to do a version of this one for you tonight. Well, you guys, you guys have a tight, your band's always been tight, you know, especially Loggins and Messina, very tight, very clean sound, and, and I think that's the key, you know, yeah. you're, you're just, you just hear the music, you just hear the musicians, you hear the instruments, you know, that, to me, that's, you know, like you said, you, you know, the bands that turn it up, you know, and, uh, they, they, sometimes they just can't capture that sound, that that magic. But you guys have, and, and you 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 know, Loggins and Messina always have. And, and you know, I told Tom Rush this. I said sometimes, you know, just a, a, a guy up on stage by himself with a guitar, a song, and a story, and he, that's it. That's all you need sometimes. That's you right. know? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's so true because you get the intimacy and the relationship between the artist performing their song and the instrument. Like when I, um, my first two or three songs that I perform on stage right now, one of them is uh, Under a Mojito Moon, and it's, um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm playing an acoustic guitar and, the, and, and drums as we start with, and it's a loud right. beat but with that. And I'm hearing my voice, and I'm hearing my guitar, and I'm feeling the feel, mm -hmm. and then the bass will come in, and it, it kind of warms it up, and the dynamic of what that is and, and how it's all falling together... Yep. It's what excites me, mm -hmm. and I and I'm hoping that that's what excites the listener, um, which I think it does. Because uh, when I go back to when I was a kid, you know, 15, 14, going to a concert to see one of my favorite artists, and at that time, I used to love to go see Dick Dale in the Delta, yep. and mm -hmm. uh, I would stand in front of the stage. Of course, he was pretty loud. Uh, I'd stand in front of that stage and I'd hear this music and this rush would go through my body <laughs> of this wonderful sounding tones and the, you know, just the drums and the groove and the sound of the hi-hat and the bass and everything yeah. just uplifting me. Uh, that's what was inspiring. And and Dick Dale's original band, um, anyone who ever can remember seeing them, they were, they were good. They had, he had like a, two guitar players he had a bass drums he had uh, I think he had a horn section too um, the, it, it was it was just phenomenal to, mm -hmm. and he, did, he did such a great job and it was very inspiring to me and I think one of the reasons why uh, you know I, I got into the music business because it was such he was such an inspiring artist guy I interviewed I was you know nice nice guy Love talking to him, Don Wilson, The Ventures. 
Oh, oh my yeah. god, that, that that was one of my favorite bands, you know, because it's, it's me too. Great, great, great music, you know. Walk Don't Run, Perfidia. Yeah. 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 Th- these are the legends, you know. That, yeah. You know. And we know why. Yeah. Now we know why. Yeah. Exactly. Are you, are you working with any new talent? Are you uh, engineering or producing some new bands out there? Or? You know, right now I'm just sort of focused on myself as an artist. I right. I had thought about that, but I have to tell you, you know, after having produced uh, the Springfield and those guys individually yeah. and collectively, and you know, spending a lot of time with Richie and Neil and Steve yeah. and Kenny, Kenny Loggins, yeah. and they've all gone on to become very, very successful. And I just, I realized at some point in time, I needed to focus on on myself as an artist. And I, I made that decision after 1976 when I came back. I did not want to go in the studio and press the record button and say, try that again, try that again, try that yeah. again, try that again. <laughs> uh, and I was tired of having moon tans, you know, from the studio. Right. Um, I just thought, you know what, what I really enjoy the most is playing. And what's very exciting is when I can write a, a song that somebody likes. Mm-hmm. While I'm not the best vocalist in the world, I do enjoy singing my material. And... Um, and, and I and I personally get um, satisfaction out of trying to do the best that I can. Right. And I realized I can't really control anything or anyone. I can try and control myself, but even then, you know, I, I can't help a note from cracking when it comes <laughs> out of my throat. So uh, I just decided to focus on myself. And if something comes along, you know, a performing artist who's really a good performing artist, songwriter. I I would put some effort in there, but Mm -hmm. again, they have to be a performing artist. I just uh, I do not want to go in the studio Mm -hmm. and just make records, you know. Sometimes I worry about the future, you know, of music and rock and roll, jazz, and you know, a lot of the the blues. Uh, We need the pioneers again, you know. All all the pioneers are gone, you know, pretty much, and so I'm I'm hoping guys like you will step in and, you know, well, it's going to be it's going to be young (laughs) folks. It's going to be young folks who appreciate the older stuff. Right. Who go, wow, that's tight, or wow, boy, that that harmony is really wonderful. And, you know, the pendulum swings, you know, there was a time when, um, you know, if you go back and you listen to Frank Sinatra's t- period, when they had the big bands and yep. Benny Goodwin and all that stuff, there was mm-hmm. some pretty hot music. And then all of a sudden this long-haired guy named Elvis yeah. Presley shows up and just screws everything up, right? Yeah, it's true. And then... And then these long-haired guys from England come in, and they really messed everything up. <laughs> so I think we're going... We, there's always that pendulum that happens. The rap music is, is interesting because it really allows a certain group of people who are not necessarily singers but have something to say. Mm-hmm. They're part of a culture. This is how they've they've learned to express themselves and how they're... You know, their followers have mm-hmm. learned to appreciate it. Now, yeah. it's different from what we're, we, we, you know, most of us who came from the, you know, the late 50s, early 60s in terms right. of first enjoying music. But I believe it will evolve because I think some of the greatest music that our country has experienced, especially has come from the, you know, the black community in terms of mm-hmm. R&B sure. and earlier before that they used to call it race music. Right. But we we get some of the greatest influence through our black community and also our Latin community, like, you know, uh, you're talking about Cuba. I mean, my God, that music is just, I mean, when you get a chance to really listen to it, it's so phenomenal, mm-hmm. so phenomenal. So I think some of the younger kids will, will start uh, listening again and perhaps grow tired of, of sort of the speaking uh, type of, lyrics or musical rhythmic expressions and start right. doing something that that'll probably even be better than anything you and I have ever heard. I hope so. It, you know, the the it's a lot of the dance type music that that's on mainstream and to me the, the, it's a lot like it's a production, you know, it's more more of dance, you know, not not much of, you know, artist playing uh music, you know, with with uh uh you know, they're not musicians. They're just you know out there performing, uh, kind of like it, it. And it's almost a, a derivative of disco. But I think disco is much better because they did have the the the, the 
to perform. Well, I, I, I think a lot of it is energy. You know, we yeah, look at energy, the energy. Right. You know, right. you look at they're they're very energetic. They're rhythmic in their body movements right. and their attitudes. And even the guys who were who evolved from the discos, you know, with the discs, and they're and they're they're taking the making rhythm out of the groove and the stylus, and they're. It's all about energy, and and I think that's what we've been experiencing as a whole group of people who may not be gifted singers necessarily, but they do have something to say, and they have a lot of energy, and even the rhythm sometimes is sporadic, but it's powerful, and I think that's that's what's been happening. And as soon as we get a younger group of people who like the idea of arrangement and like the idea mm-hmm. of harmony right. and uh, God knows what will what will evolve from that, but something special. <laughs> your son, your son Julian, uh, is yes. a recording engineer, right, and a musician That's as well. Yeah. Yes. So, so he, we, we have hope there. How old is he? Well, he's twenty four, and uh, okay. it's interesting because um, he grew up listening to. Um, he, he grew up as a drummer. You know, at four years old, I had him, uh, Eddie Taduri, who was a drummer for me at the time, got him started playing drums. And he uh, would go to bed at night. He loved all kinds of music. He'd listen to everything. In fact, one time he said, uh, I walked in, and I, he had some headphones on. He was probably six, and they were just so loud. And I went, tapped him on the shoulder, and I said, Julian, Julian, I said, what are you doing? I said, what are you listening to? It's It's too loud. He goes, oh, Daddy. He says, you'll like this. And he goes, click, 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 click on his little CD player. And he says, listen to this. So I put it on. And it was uh, was some acoustic music, you know, with acoustic guitar. And I looked at him and I said, you know what? This kid has only seen me perform in acoustic workshops and and my songwriter's performance workshop. He thinks this is is who I am and what I like. (laughs) And he was listening to the Batman theme. Uh, you know the Batman movies. It was this intense uh, yeah, music, yep. and so. Um, but at night, when he went to bed, he couldn't go to sleep unless he listened to the jazz station. So we oh, wow. had the jazz station on at night all night. And as he grew up and became a drummer, his taste became very sophisticated, and he started questioning uh, albums and who was playing it. And he found that the awesome. Bec- that uh, you know Jeff Beccaro was playing on this one. Yeah. And, yep. You know, just all the hip drummers. So he's got a very sophisticated ear, um, and um, and I think he's one of those kids that will probably move us into a direction where production and sound Excellent. and harmonies and and yep. rhythms are are going to be very important. Yep, he's the future of music. Jim, Jim, here's your last question. Uh, this is a question I ask everyone that I've interviewed. If you had a feel the dreams wish like the movie, uh, to perform, collaborate, uh, engineer for, produce with anyone uh, from the past or the present, who would that be? And you've worked with so many great artists, so it's I know it's tough. <laughs> you know, I don't know that I can answer that question. I, <laughs> I think that through my life I've always made the choices of being with the people that I want to work with, and, and when I could afford it, hire the people to be there that could... Reproduce it. So I, I I think I've I've been in that field of dreams all my life. Um, all your life, huh? How, how about somebody that has passed? You know, from way back, back in the uh, early days or something, early blues or. Uh... Well, you know, I, I I wish I only wish I'd have taken the opportunity to see Elvis Presley play yep. live. Yeah. Um. He did. Uh, he did uh, a little one of my songs in a medley one time, and uh, it was kind of neat hearing him do that. Um, yeah. I um I I think of all the people I would have liked to have seen him perform at least and, you know cuz I I love Scotty Moore was such a great mm-hmm. guitarist. Yeah. I would have liked to have seen him before he got into the the Las Vegas stuff. Right. Right. I think he was um uh, I think he was a, a really shining star when he was kept on a real grassroots level as a performer the moment they started signing him to do movies and stuff mm-hmm. like that um, while his energy was, was certainly there and he wanted to do a great job I think we, we lost uh, a really great 
performing artist. I mean, I would have to put him right on right on the same scale as John Lennon mm-hmm. and uh, uh, the Beatles at that point in time when they were, you know, they were performing in, in England just before they got into being too big. There, there's just something that happens to an artist when they get to yep. be too big. Yeah. I think they lose their they they lose that special uh, quality <clears throat> that they have. They lose, and that's, they lose their roots. You know. They lose their roots, and and yeah. I, and I think, and for me, I, I've learned over the years that it's because I've I've worked on the other side of the glass, been an engineer, and mm-hmm. having to get there early to lay out mics and cables and leave late, you know, gathering them up and putting them away. I've watched artists come and go and their attitudes and where they are, and it's it's interesting to to see how the the ego can evolve and develop and how success can make someone less adept at hiding their true nature, whether it be a, a, a good nature or, or bad nature, you know, behavior. Mm-hmm. So um, I, I find when we lose our roots, we lose who we are, where we are, where we come from, and what our goal was, um, yeah. I, I think we, we, we suffer not only personally, but our, our audiences uh, re- really lose out as well. I think you're right. I think you're right. There's not many uh, big bands that have stuck to their roots, you know, after all these years. I'm, I'm going to have to do some research and, and see if I can come down with a list of guys have, that have done that. <laughs> be interesting. Yeah, it's, it, it's, it's going to be a sh- short-lived, I'll tell yeah. you. Yeah. I, that's why I say when I'm, when I'm performing, you know, I introduce my guys. I say, you know, I've been working with Craig since 1979, and yep. I worked with... George in 1976, and and uh, Gary's been with me since 1992, I think. And mm-hmm. while Dave has is, is only been here since 2004, hell, it's only been 12 years for him. <laughs> yeah. um, we we really we really enjoy working with one another. Yeah. Um, I only wish I could pay them more. They're worth a lot more than I do pay them. But for some reason, they they do stick around. They like to play the music, and we have a lot of fun, and we have camaraderie and. Um, there's a lot of appreciation for each other's talent, and I, I like that in a band where mm-hmm. people are not, you know, picking the, picking at somebody. Uh, yeah, exactly. Having them. fun, having fun yeah. is the main thing, you know. Absolutely. You have well, fun listen, I'm going to have to say goodbye myself. Are we? Are you good for everything you we're, need? We're good. We we right, right down to the uh, second. I want to okay. I want to thank you so much for being on the show today, Jim. And uh, a, you know, I especially love it. for for all the great music you've given us over the years. And have fun on the tour, you know. And I will. And I'll, as soon as I get your uh, uh, email address, I will upload this music for you uh, so you can cut it into where we've talked sure. about it. And, and, I appreciate uh, that. Thank you so much. My pleasure. All right, Jim. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye now. For further information about Jim Messina, visit www.jimmessina.com. Jim Messina is also on Facebook, www.facebook.com backslash Jim Messina Music. Jim Messina on Twitter, twitter.com backslash Jim underscore Messina. To purchase In the Groove with special guest Rusty Young and live at the Clark Center for the Performing Arts, visit www.jimmessina.bandcamp.com. Dot com. Very special thanks today to Phyllis Saucy for setting up this interview with Jim Messina and to Doug and Don Newsome with BBS Radio for making it all happen every show. Join me bi-weekly Mondays at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern on the Ray Shasho Show. If you have comments or suggestions or would like to be a guest on the Ray Shasho Show, call 941-877-1552 or email us at Ray Publicity Works Agency. Dot com. And please don't forget to purchase a copy of my book entitled Check the G's, The True Story of an Eclectic American Family in the Wacky Family Business, or the second edition entitled Wacky Shenanigans on F Street, Proud to be Politically Incorrect in Washington, D.C., available now at Amazon.com. I promise you will live it. Have a great week, everybody. <laughs>
It's all because your mama don't dance and your daddy don't ride your road. Your mama don't dance and your daddy don't ride your road. Oh, and Ian and Ross around and a town of the town where they go rusty. Thank you, everybody, for listening to the Ray Shasho Show, brought to you by the Publicity Works Agency. Call 941 877 one five five two or visit us at publicityworksagency.com specializing in author and music artist publicity plans we shine when we make you shine join ray shasho every monday at 3 p.m pacific 6 p.m eastern on pbs radio station one